few weeks ago on the PC Gamer Chatlog podcast, our wonderful hosts talked about the fact that Pokemon never came to PC, and how no imitators have ever really managed to capture Pokemon's charm. Well, last year, I played a demo for a game that really caught my attention, and it's just come out, literally just now. Cassette Beasts sees you be teleported to a strange island where strange creatures roam and can be recorded into cassette tapes. You can then take on their form and battle other monsters as you try to find a way back home. Having loved the demo last year, I thought I'd reach out to the developers on the approach to the game's launch, and I asked Jay Bayliss some questions about their game to dig into my own personal curiosities. Let's see what they had to say, and then after that, I'll tell you my thoughts on the game as a whole. First, let's start out with a classic. If you could sum up Cassette Beasts in three sentences, what would they be? We use Adventure Battle Transform as sort of a tagline, and that works quite well here, I think. We want Cassette Beasts to feel like an adventure above all else. Second, I want to know more about the music. It really stands out to me as I play. Who's responsible for it, and how is it part of the game's vision during development? Our composer is Joel Bayliss, who is also my brother. We worked with Joel from the very beginning, carving out the identity of Cassette Beasts, and wanted to go for a sound that feels unique and also taps into Joel's skills as a guitarist. There's a lot of influence from stuff he and I grew up with, including vocal tracks was very Sonic Adventure inspired choice, for example. In the same way that the look of the game takes inspiration from various sources, the musical aesthetic of the game lands somewhere between 1980s British New Wave, lo-fi beats, and a rockin' anime theme song. Third, and this is a bit more of a nerdy one, Cassette Beasts is made in Godot, making it potentially the biggest game release made using the engine thus far. Godot is a contentious engine to some, but you seem to have achieved quite a lot with it. Would you say your game benefited from being made in this engine, or did it make development more of a struggle? As far as I'm aware, Cassette Beasts is the biggest Godot game up to this point. The decision to use Godot was spearheaded by Tom, lead programmer at Bitten Studio and the other half of the team. And I really don't think we could have made the game at this scale without it. Whilst there's been some technical challenges as a result of it, its ease of use and customizability as an open source engine has really allowed us to spend as much time as possible simply making the game rather than wrestling with the engine. Fourth, when I'm playing games like Pokemon, only about 1 in 10 of the monster designs really grab my attention, but in Cassette Beasts, every time I see a new monster I think to myself, I've gotta have it. In fact, I think it's cool to make it as hard as it is to get tapes in the game, but not really. How much time was spent designing each of the game's monsters? I'm glad to hear! Drawing creature designs has been something I've loved doing since I was a kid, so getting to work on a whole monster roster has been a dream come true. Having to design close to 120 myself means that some monsters were sketched out by me very quickly, whilst others took a lot of revisions. The two starter monsters, Bansheep and Candevil, came very late in the project because we spent so long fine-tuning their designs. We also have a handful of designs from guest artists, which was a fun collaboration. Fifth, which monster is your favorite? I actually think Candevil is my favorite. It's a devil with a coke bottle body. It's very sugar themed. Six, some of the game's inspirations obviously come to mind straight away, but what's some more obscure influences on the game that people might not guess? Whilst Pokemon might be an obvious go-to inspiration, a lot of the feel of the game, at least on my end, comes from memories of playing Digimon World on the PS1 as a kid. There's something about the unknowable world it presents, and slowly untangling it that really stuck with me. Outside of the realm of games, I think the narrative themes are inspired by comic books of Grant Morrison, and particularly ones like Doom Patrol and Multiversity, especially in regards to the nature and relationship between fiction, mythology, the multiverse, and creators. Seven. I'm a big fan of cryptids and contemporary mythology, and I've noticed a lot of the creature designs here are similar to things like spring Jack, Mothman, the Flatwoods Monster, UFOs. This ties in with some of the plot elements about objects and ideas being transported to this other world that you can see in the demo and that I'm seeing further in the game now. But how many of the monsters are based on real-world monsters like these? We're big fans of cryptids too, so there's a reason behind this. One, we wanted to avoid what I call the elemental animal design philosophy, where the monsters are broadly animals with an elemental theming. Other games do enough of this already. Cryptids are a great source of inspiration, and they have allowed us to make some very strange or unusual monsters. Second, a lot of the themes in the background of the game involve human ideas and inspiration, and utilizing mythology and cryptozoology taps into that quite nicely. I like to imagine that, within the fiction of the game, the creatures we invent have a lot more power behind them than the ones we know to exist. 8. I want to know what part of the game 
or piece of the game you're most excited for people to see. I like to hope that people will be pleasantly surprised by the narrative side of things. We've tried to make the characters in the game quite fleshed out compared to what you might expect, and the character plot lines take some unexpected and surprising turns. I think characters are what's sticking people's minds more than anything in games, so I hope people remember their adventures in Cassette Beasts long after they finished playing. Nine, and finally, having now beaten the game, another thing that made me smile was seeing a lot of things that felt very familiar. I know Bitten is based in Brighton, and the game has a very British feel to it outside of the obvious JRPG influence. Seeing moves like Bish Bash Bosh, or enemies based on certain villains from certain time-traveling Monster of the Week TV shows, and having grown up in Somerset, seeing places like Glastainbury Abbey really made my eyes bulge. Are these inclusions something you were really pushing for in the game, or did they kind of just happen naturally? Great question. So Tom and I actually both grew up on the Wirral Peninsula in Merryside, and there's all sorts of local references scattered throughout the game. We really wanted to give the game a uniquely British feel. On top of the extensive, on top of the extensive influence from the genre of games, the turn-based RPG, that is traditionally Japanese. If you look at Britain in the 80s, there was a real resurgence of independent British comic artists, writers, musicians, and even early indie game devs that were blazing trails with subversive and uniquely British works. I like to think that we're hearkening back to that in our own little way. Well, we've heard plenty about the game now, but is it worth playing? I'd say a resounding yes. To prepare for this video, I played the game all the way through on my Steam Deck, and it has been a perfect game to pull out and just stick some time into it. The story and the characters are fun and engaging, and has a rigid loop and structure, while still being interesting enough to make you want to push through all the way to the end. All this, as well as some fun movement abilities and monsters that all play a unique role in the world as you explore, and need to be avoided or captured in different ways, makes this a consistently fun experience. Of course, though, the monster battling is the most important part, and is a highlight, actually, with each beast in the game having a vivid appeal that even the eponymous Pokemon has never really managed to maintain. Seriously, I couldn't get enough cassettes to capture all the beasts I wanted as I explored because I just wanted all of them. If I had a recording of the sharp, audible gasp I made upon seeing the Flatwoods monster-inspired beast that made my partner convinced I'd hurt myself somehow, I'd put it in here. There's a variety of moves, called stickers, that can be moved around and shuffled between beasts as many times as you like, as long as the beast supports that move's element. Each fight on the standard difficulty is never a genuine challenge as such, but they will have you thinking on your feet. Things work differently here to other monster catching and battling games, with your beast's health bar only covering your own. And if you get overkill on your beast's health, then you yourself take damage, upping the stakes from other monster catching fare. The pacing of introducing new enemy types and variations is well handled. Considering the freedom the game gives you to its world straight off the bat, it always felt like it had a new trick up its sleeve without ever feeling overwhelming. It's not a perfect experience, sure, the exploration is sometimes halted by abruptly placed loading screens in the middle of the open world and it can sometimes be hard to tell where my character is stood during exploration, particularly when trying to traverse walls with the sticky cactus ability, where up and toward the camera can be hard to tell the difference between. Overall though, these are minor quibbles, and this is probably one of my favorite games of the year so far. I'd love to see more cassette beasts in future, and I highly recommend the game. Thanks for watching. If you think there are some other indie games that look particularly great, please let me know down in the comments below so I can check them out. And whilst you're down there, be sure to like the video and subscribe to the PC Gamer channel.